Well, hello and happy Valentine's Day. Welcome to another crime dive. My name is Crystal Sky, and if you're anything like me, you find yourself drawn to true crime cases. So that's what I talk about. If you like true crime and you also want to feel better about your makeup skills, you should absolutely like, subscribe, and let's hang out together every Tuesday where I will take a deep dive look into a true crime case while slapping on the old clown paint. Like I said, happy Valentine's Day. Are you guys doing anything? Do you have anyone special? If it's not a significant other, maybe it's a friend or even a pet or a hey man, you can be your own Valentine. I did that all many, many years and I had lots of fun. Whatever you choose to do, I hope that it is just happy and safe and wonderful for you. And I do have a quick announcement before we get into today's case, which man, is a really brutal one. I am going to be taking the month of March off. Yes, I know, I have to take a hiatus. This, just things are really backing up. I've got a lot of stuff that I'm working on right now, balancing a lot. So unfortunately, I am going to take a break from the Crime Dive series for the month of March. I think I'm still going to upload the Crime Dip series on Thursdays, just because that's more like lower key re research, because it's, you know, like breaking cases or cases without a lot of information and stuff. But yeah, um, I just, I have to take a break for the month of March, but I will be back in April, I promise. I will be back April 4th. And yeah, I just, I need some time to, to catch up on some stuff and yeah, just, just take care of life in general, you know? But we still have this entire month to go through, all right? I still have got like three cases for you, including today's, which is yet again, another requested case. This case was suggested to me by Kristen Cook. And yeah, definitely disclaimer warning in this case. This is a just, a very heart-wrenching one today. The victims in today's case are children, the youngest being five years old. And yeah, man, this was, this was a tough one to research. Not gonna lie, man. Not gonna lie. Today, we will be discussing the case of Kevin Dunlap. And yeah, this one is just, not only is it brutal, there's really no clear answer as to why this happened. And and we'll, we'll get all into it, but it's definitely, I think, one of the many things that makes this case especially frustrating, you know? And yeah, without further ado... Let's get into this case. So the time of the events of today's case takes place in October of 2008, all right? So I'm gonna sort of set the scene for you. So Christy Friendsley, who was 36 years old, lived in the rural unincorporated community of Roaring Spring, Kentucky. She lived on Military Road and Roaring Spring was actually located near the Fort Campbell military base, which lies on the Tennessee-Kentucky state line. Now, Christy was a hairstylist, but she had lost her job earlier that year of 2008. And at this time, Christy is living in a, in her home in Roaring Spring, Kentucky with her three young children. There was 17-year-old Kayla Elaine Williams, 14-year-old Courtney Lan McBurney Friendsley, and five-year-old Ethan Zane Friendsley. Now, Kayla's father was Doug Williams, and he was an army major who lived in Atwater, California. Now, I know Kayla had lived with him, and at the time of of today's case, she had recently moved back with her mother in Kentucky, and she had spoken to her father about returning to California in order to go to college. At this point in time, in October of 2008, Kayla was a senior at the Trigg County High School, where she was secretary of her senior class, president of the school's Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America chapter. She was said to have loved soccer, loved riding four-wheelers, loved going swimming, just loved doing outdoor activities in general. She had also participated participated in the County Ham Festival's beauty pageant, which was held at the high school gymnasium. Doug said of his daughter, quote, My daughter was exactly like every other teenage girl. Her biggest thing in life was wanting to get her license. She was a girl that could walk in a room and everyone in there would think she was an absolute angel in minutes. Hannah Willett said on her first day at high school, she was, you know, completely brand new to the area. Kayla immediately walked up to her, asked her if she was new, and immediately befriended her. Quote, she came up to me the first day of school and asked if I was new there. She showed me everywhere I needed to go. Now, Doug and Christy had divorced not long after Kayla had been born, and I'm not quite sure who Kayla had spent a majority of her life with 
with, her father, mother, if it was shared. Not too sure about those details. And I'm not sure when, but Christy and Courtney's father, Roy McBurney, who lived in Michigan, also eventually separated. I'm not sure how long they were together or if they were like officially married or anything like that. I have no details about that. But at the time of the events of today's case, Courtney was a freshman at Trigg County High School and she was described as quiet, loving, and caring. In her online profiles on MySpace and Bebo, yeah, old school, she stated that she first and foremost loved God, was happiest when she was around her friends and skateboarding. She liked hard rock and rap music, loved chicken and dumplings, and said that her favorite color was orange and that her biggest fear was sharks. Her friend, Thad Reidner, said Courtney could often be seen eating Pop-Tarts walking down the school halls. He said, quote, she was nice. She never really made anybody mad. She always had a smile on her face and that made other people smile. I love those kinds of people. I always wish I could be one of those people. I have resting bitch face like nobody else. I always wish I could be one of those people. It just always had like a smile on your face. You know when people are just, they're so happy and they smile and it just, it makes you happier, you know? I love being around those kinds of people. And that seemed to be the kind of person that Courtney was. Also at the time of the events of today's case, Christy and Ethan's father, Jeffrey Friendsley, had divorced. It had been finalized in February earlier that year, 2008. And Jeffrey was a master sergeant in the army and he was stationed at Fort Campbell. Now for a time after the divorce, the couple did share custody of Ethan. But in July of that year, 2008, Jeffrey took Christy to court trying to get full custody of Ethan. And he made a lot of claims against his ex-wife, saying that Christy drank in front of the children, that she kept an untidy house, and failed to take Ethan to the doctor regularly. However, Trig Circuit Judge C.A. Woody Woodall III found that none of Jeffrey's claims had any substance to them. Court-ordered tests proved that Christy was not drinking, wasn't on drugs. And on October 1st, 2008, Judge Woodall refused to alter the custody arrangement. And so Christy and Jeffrey, I think, continued sharing custody. But I'm not sure what the details were. If, like, Christy had primary custody and Jeffrey just saw his son, like, on the weekend or something, not sure about those details. Now, now, on October 9th, so like a week after this ruling, Christy was arrested and charged for public intoxication. And this was after a Trigg County Sheriff's deputy noticed she was acting like, quote, strange. And this was after a beauty pageant, the one that Kayla had participated in. And at the time of the events of today's case, that case was pending. Ethan was in kindergarten at the Trigg County Primary School, and he was described as being talkative and loving animals and was said to have really enjoyed riding his bike. Now, Ethan would only spend three days at this school before the events of today's case. And he had attended preschool at Katie's United Methodist Church, which was next door to the school district's central office. Trigg County School Superintendent Tim McGinnis said Ethan was, quote, full of life. He loved people and, quote, he would just catch anybody's heart. Now, about a week prior to the events of today's case, a man in a direct TV van stopped by Christie's house. And he stopped by to ask for directions and inquire about her home being for sale. Christy was currently trying to sell it, so of course there was a for sale sign in her yard. Other reports state that he was also there to install a satellite dish. This man was 36-year-old Kevin Wayne Dunlap. Now, Kevin had actually lived down the street from Christy and her children, six houses down to be exact, for a period of time. But at this point, when he stops by Christy's house, he was living in Hopkinsville with his wife, Stephanie, and their three young children. Now, according to court documents, a divorce case was dismissed in 2004 without the marriage dissolving. Kevin's mother is Sheila Dunlap, and she worked as a prison guard in Texas. She said Kevin did not have a normal childhood, and this was primarily due to his demanding, domineering father. Quote, he wanted them to be perfect. She said Kevin and his father did not have a good relationship, to put it mildly. Quote, I would say it would have to have been strained because he was very strict on him. Now, Kevin ended up serving in the army for from 1989 to 2002, where he served as a special operations soldier and did work as a helicopter mechanic for the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, a group known as the Night Stalkers, based out of Fort Campbell. After being released from the Army, Kevin then served two years for the Kentucky National Guard in a now defunct unit based out of Hopkinsville. And I'm not sure when he started working here, but at the time of the events of today's case, Kevin was employed with Brewster and Associates Incorporated, which subcontracted work for DirecTV. So let's get a little bit more 
into Kevin. So Stephanie, Kevin's wife, whose maiden name is Lehman, Stephanie Lehman, said that she met her husband through some neighbors of her parents. She was actually still in high school when they met, and I'm pretty sure Kevin was not in school. Yeah. Stephanie also had a three-month-old daughter named Brooke, and she said the two of them only dated for nine months before they were married. Stephanie said at first she thought Kevin was, you know, quote, kind and quote, gentle. He treated Brooke as if she were his own, and he was really good with her. And for a time, Stephanie said that the family was genuinely happy, and they never told Brooke that Kevin wasn't her biological father. That was the father that, you know, she knew. A year and a half after they were married, Kevin and Stephanie had their own child, a son they would end up naming Kevin Jr. They would end up having another son several years later named Aiden. Now, Stephanie said at first their marriage, yeah, was just average and and happy and normal. Nothing was amiss. But slowly... Over the years, things started to change, and there were many times, years into the marriage, that Kevin would show his his hostility, his anger, you know, his, his dark side. And he started exhibiting controlling, domineering, just possessive behavior over his family. So there's a series on the Investigation Discovery channel, Evil Lives Here, and I saw the one about Kevin, and they interviewed Stephanie and Brooke. And Stephanie in that was explaining how one time, all right, this was uh, one incident where Kevin would exhibit his violent behavior and his penchant for just being controlling and and just domineering. So one time they were all eating dinner and I think Brooke and Kevin Jr. were, I don't know, probably like, I don't know, six, seven, eight, something like that. And they were all, you know, eating dinner at the table when out of nowhere, Kevin snapped at Brooke and told her that she wasn't holding her utensils correctly. And no matter what she did, according to Brooke, she couldn't hold it correctly for Kevin. And he like chastised her. She said she got hit, quote, pretty hard. And she said that they were not allowed to cry when Kevin hit them. Otherwise, that would just make like the beating worse. They weren't allowed to show any emotion at all. Finally, Kevin told Brooke that she was not allowed to get up from the dinner table until she had finished her dinner and until she held her utensil correctly. And slowly but surely, you know, the family rose one by one as they finished their dinner, with Brooke still sitting there at the table. And hours later, while Kevin was in the shower, Stephanie said she came into the kitchen and saw Brooke still at the table. I don't know if she was aware that she had been at the table this whole time or what, but that's when she told her daughter to, you know, go off, you know, go to your room or whatever, and just tell Kevin that you ate the dinner. And then she got rid of the dinner and hid it from Kevin. And as time went on, incidents like this just increased, and the whole family just learned to walk on eggshells. Anything could set Kevin off, and no one wanted to to do that, you know? Meanwhile, Kevin just became more controlling, more domineering, and just started exhibiting that control and domination over his whole family. So one way in which Kevin sort of expressed his, like, control dominance, if you will, was to purposely set off, like, Stephanie's triggers. So one of Stephanie's triggers was that she hated when people, like, touched her feet or, like, tickled them or anything, right? Like, and, you know, it might sound, you know, silly to you, but, you know, some people have have these boundaries for a reason, you know? It made her physically uncomfortable. And she was talking about how, you know, Kevin knew this. And I I don't know if this was on more than one occasion, but she did say Kevin would like tickle her feet. And one time he actually got the kids involved and he told them that they were going to go quote, like tickle mommy and kind of like make a game out of it. And so while she was on the couch, he pinned her down and had the kids like tickle Stephanie's feet. And again, it might not seem like that big of a deal, you know, to you or me or, you know, other people. But, you know, remember this was like a physical trick for Stephanie. This was something that made her physically uncomfortable, you know, mentally, emotionally, like every way in which you could be uncomfortable. That's what this made her feel like. And Kevin knew this. And she always felt like this was, you know, Kevin's way of asserting his dominance, you know, and also clearly showing that he doesn't respect her at all, right? They can't stand when people, you know, do that, right? Where someone will say, you know, oh, you know, this bothers me or, you know, I'm allergic to this. And then you've always got people that have to push those boundaries, right? And for that to be her husband, you know, acting like that, like, knowing just how uncomfortable it made her. And then incorporating the kids into it, yeah. Kevin's violent behavior also grew. So Brooke spoke about how one time her and her brothers were just watching TV and on the living room, minding their own business, when all of a sudden Kevin just came storming in, demanding to know where their mother was. You know, just so happens she was asleep in the master bedroom, taking a nap. And when Brooke told him this, you know, he, you know, just marched right off into the bedroom. Brooke said he was highly agitated and wound up, was just like clearly very angry. So once inside the bedroom, 
bedroom, Kevin awoke his sleeping wife by yanking her from the bed by her hair and like shoving her and slamming her up against the wall. Now, Stephanie, you know, was dead asleep when this occurred. And so, of course, she was like completely disoriented, was in shock. And as Kevin slammed her up against the wall, her head banged up against it. She started crying and he told her that he would give her something to cry about. He continued pushing and shoving and grabbing Stephanie, like moving his way downstairs to the front room in front of the children. Stephanie continued to plead and beg her husband to stop that he was hurting her. But Kevin just kept hitting her, punching her, pushing her. He pushed her out of the house and the fight spilled into the front yard. Stephanie was, you know, pleading with him at that point, apologizing for upsetting him at that point, anything to get him to stop. And she later said that she oddly felt almost safer in the front yard because they were like in front of neighbors and stuff. And after she apologized, Kevin just seemed to calm down and then he just like walked away. Brooke said that this was the first time she ever witnessed Kevin lay hands on her mother. And she said she was stunned not just by the assault, but by her mother's reaction to it. She said her mother just sort of like went on and pretended it didn't happen. And Brooke was said that she was just left wondering like why her mother wasn't angry and pissed off at what Kevin had just done to her. And I'm not sure how old Brooke was when this happened, but in that episode Evil Lives Here, the reenactment had the actress playing Brooke like around, I don't know, eight or nine or so. So as time went on, the physical assaults became more commonplace and Kevin's temper grew and grew shorter more violent, and any little thing would set him off. Stephanie said that he would constantly, you know, hold her down, punch her, kick her, tell her she was stupid, useless, lazy, and he would always injure her in places that were easily covered up by clothes, or he was careful to injure her to not leave marks. Stephanie said she never called the police on Kevin because she was afraid of what he would do to both her and her children when he was inevitably let go or released or whatever, you know, she she had it in her mind that even if he did go to jail or whatever, once he got out, he would definitely come after them. And like many battered women, Stephanie did her best to hide the abuse, hide any marks, and just tried to pretend that her family was happy and normal. And as Brooke and the children grew older, they learned to not speak of the abuse, not talk about it. And this was especially true when Kevin's mother, Sheila, would come to visit. So according to Stephanie, Kevin always put on a show for his mother, always trying to act like he was like the best son and husband and father. And of course, his whole family, you know, petrified of him, always did their best to add to this persona. On top of exhibiting violent behavior, Kevin also started amassing a collection of guns, including handguns and rifles. And these, of course, made Stephanie very nervous. She didn't really like guns, especially loaded guns in the house with children. But Kevin would always just tell her they were for in case anyone ever broke into the home. One time, Kevin got the idea to use his pellet gun on broken and Kevin Jr. Mm -hmm. His own children. So I guess they were just like, you know, in the living room, minding their own business, talking or whatever, when all of a sudden, Kevin started shooting at them with his pellet gun. Brooke said Kevin was laughing the whole time, like as if it was like all one big joke. And as her and her brother begged for their father to stop, he just kept like laughing and just shooting at them. Brooke said that they never told their mother about this incident. Remember, the family learned to never, never discuss or say anything, right? So they did what, you know, they were raised with and they kept quiet. Another violent incident occurred during one Halloween when Kevin discovered that Steph had the audacity to eat some of his Halloween candy. She had went to the store and bought some of his favorite candy and had the audacity to have a couple pieces. And Kevin somehow noticed this. He yelled at her and when Stephanie went to turn away because she had learned to just walk away from him when he was like yelling at her and stuff, it was then out of nowhere that Kevin pulled a gun on her and held a gun to her head. All because she ate some Halloween candy. He told her it would be easy for him to kill her, kill her at any moment. She cried and, you know, begged Kevin to, you know, put the gun down and not harm her. She would never do it again. She was sorry. She apologized profusely. And she said Kevin then just, you know, calmly put the gun down and walked away. After this incident, Stephanie said Kevin didn't talk to her, literally didn't talk to her, ignored her for two months. Yeah, just completely ignored her. She was like, yeah, like he ignored me. We, like we shared a bed even and he just ignored me for like two months. Didn't talk to me, didn't acknowledge me at all. Now at this point in time, it had been years and years of this kind of behavior and abuse, all right? So of course, you know, Stephanie, like many battered spouses, internalized it, normalized it even. She never sought out help 
never spoke about the abuse, and just wrapped that facade of a happy family around her. Honestly, I got to imagine that Kevin ignoring her for two months had to have been an improvement than him constantly berating her. But it wasn't long after all of this, when Kevin, you know, began ignoring her or whatever, that Stephanie noticed her husband exhibiting odd behavior. The physical beatings became less and less. He began sleeping less and less. And he spent more and more time alone in his man cave, which was a room above the garage. And it got to the point where Kevin just completely ignored all of the family. He would just come home from work and immediately go into his man cave, not eat with the family, not acknowledge them or anything. Again, I gotta imagine that's gotta be some sort of vast improvement over, you know, the abuse. Physical abuse, that is. One night when it was storming really bad, Stephanie woke up. It was in the middle of the night and she noticed that Kevin wasn't in bed. When she got up to look for him, she was shocked to see him in Brooke's bed. Brooke said that she woke up and realized that her dad was next to her sleeping, which, you know, freaked her out because he was not there when she had laid down. Stephanie managed to rouse Kevin, you know, and ushered him to their bed. And she said he just seemed very confused and disoriented, not really knowing like where he was. But she also saw him drink earlier in the evening. And so she thought, okay, maybe he just like got a little drunk and stumbled into the wrong room. Kevin then began disappearing at all hours of the night. At this point in time, he was working for the Brewster and Associates Incorporated doing the DirecTV satellite installs. And he would tell Stephanie that he had jobs at like 9 p.m., you know, like 9 at night. Now, Stephanie thought maybe Kevin was having an affair. Um, It turned out, you know, he was not. There was no evidence that he was ever having an affair. And to this day, Stephanie has no idea what Kevin was doing when he was out supposedly doing these service calls in the middle of the night. So that's sort of the setup to the events of today's case. So we have the Friendsleys, and now we have this direct TV installer guy who had come to their home, Kevin Dunlap, who is, you know, an abusive prick to his family. So let's go to the date, October 15th, 2008, all right? So that was a setup. So now this is the date. So it's the middle of the day, right? Broad daylight. And Christy was finishing up some yard work in her backyard, talking on the phone with a friend. Quote, she was in the backyard doing lawn work when a man came up to her wearing a blue short-sleeved polo shirt. The man was also wearing jeans and a pair of white Reebok athletic shoes. Christy recognized him as the direct TV guy who had come to her home about a week earlier. And remember, he had asked about her home for sale. And this time he asked her for a tour of her home. To which, you know, Christy agreed. She said when they got inside, Kevin remained quiet, and so she, you know, started the tour. And then, as she was showing him the bathroom, he put a handgun to her head and forced her into Ethan's bedroom. Quote, He pushed my face down to the bed. He put my hands behind my back and put zip ties on my wrists and put zip ties on my ankles. How frightening would that be? Broad daylight, guys. Broad daylight in her yard doing the same mundane thing that she's done hundreds of times. And this guy who had been to her home earlier was an installer. Oh, okay. Tour of the home because she's selling the home. Something that I'm sure she had done, you know, a few times. And now she's a prisoner in her own home. How scary is that? Article said that Christy did try to escape once, but she was unable to. I don't know any other details other than that. Kevin then led Christy from Ethan's bedroom to her own bedroom. After forcing her to sit up on her bed, which, you know, not an easy feat when your ankles and wrists are bound, Kevin asked her if there were any guns in the house. Quote, he wanted to smoke a cigarette and he put a cigarette in my mouth. And I told him, I can't smoke a cigarette without a drink of tea, Coke. I have to have something. He lit my cigarette and I believe it was at that time he made me take a drink of something in a brown bag. That something was a sip of Crown Royal whiskey, which Kevin had brought with him and was in a brown paper bag. She said Kevin then like paced up and down the hallways of her home. She could hear him opening and closing windows. Kevin asked her when her children were expected home and she at first lied and said three. 45 p.m. And he became irritated when they did not show up at that time. In actuality, it was the end of the school day and her children were on their way home. She was just trying to stall for time. And she even said, quote, I asked him the first time. I asked him if he would just do whatever he was going to do and leave before the kids got home. And he told me to shut up. Then I asked him if he would let me go to the door and tell the kids to go to the neighbor's house and I'd be over to get them in a few minutes. And he told me no and to shut up. She heard the school bus that dropped off her kids drive by and she said she saw as her three children entered the home laughing and, you know, talking with each other about their day. Again, can you imagine, guys, just like 
like any other day, going home, we were supposed to feel safe, and these poor kids walked into the worst situation. Upon entering the home, the children immediately saw their mother bound up and, you know, offered to, to release her. And that's when Kevin emerged out of nowhere, swinging a knife round menacingly. He threatened them, forced them to lie on their stomachs, and bound their hands behind their backs. He bound Ethan up with pantyhose and bound Courtney and Kayla up with the zip ties that he had brought. He then led them away one by one, putting them in separate rooms. Christy later said, quote, Ethan started to cry and asked the man why he was doing this and why he was hurting his mommy. Ethan started crying. He wanted his mommy and he kept asking the man, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this to my mommy? I love my mommy. Why are you hurting her? Are you going to hurt me? When he tied Kayla, Ethan said he wanted to hug me. Dunlap said he could. And then Christy got the last hug she would ever get from her baby boy from any of her children. Oh, this, this was really, really tough to, to read about. I can't even imagine what was going through any of their heads. Like, how awful would this be, guys? Kevin then, like I said, ushered the children out of the room, put them all in separate locations. He then went back to Christy, where, quote, he closed the door and he told me it was going to be either me or my daughter. He was going to sexually assault either me or my daughter. And Christy told him to assault her. And that's, that's exactly what he did. After he washed Christy off in the bathtub by hosing her off with the shower. He placed her on her bed and then told her he was going to have to, quote, put her out. And then he attempted to strangle her. However, this isn't the movies, and so that didn't work. When that didn't work, he attempted to snap her neck, but that too failed. And that's when he just threw Christy on the bed and smothered her with a pillow. But... You know, that didn't work either. And that is when Kevin got out a knife, a butter knife, and stabbed Christy multiple times. Once in the left ear, twice in the lower back, and four times in her neck before he attempted to slice her throat open. He was so forceful, part of the butter knife actually broke off in Christy's neck. Quote, he started cutting my neck, is all Christy said. Now, as Kevin was brutally stabbing Christy, she realized that she was going to have to play dead in order to get him to stop. And that's exactly what she did. She tried to lay very still, held her breath, and hoped that Kevin thought that he had killed her. And it worked. He did. He thought Christy was dead. He half covered her with a blanket and then proceeded to each one of the children's rooms. And here he would brutally stab each one. And before he left, Christy saw Kevin douse the house in some sort of flammable liquid and light it on fire. And she was able to see this by discreetly peeking out of the blanket that he had covered her with. And with her hands and ankles still bound and gravely injured, Christy saw the flames growing and knew that she had to get out of the house. When she knew that Kevin had left the home, she got out from under the blanket and could see across the hall into Ethan's bedroom. And she saw him lying still on some cushions. Quote, I peeked out. He was on a big pile of pillows. It looked like he was sleeping. I was going to take the blanket and grab Ethan. I didn't know how I was doing it, but I was doing it. So even with hands bound behind her back and her ankles bound, she managed to like get a hold of some sort of blanket, maybe the blanket that was covering her. But unfortunately... There was no time to try to save her son. Flames like erupted, her foot caught on fire, and she realized that her legs were not working properly. I don't know if she maybe had lost circulation in them, but like they were not kind of like responding to her commands, you know? So Christy, still bound, managed to make her way to her back doors. They were a pair of French doors. And she managed to leverage the door handle with one, with one of her legs. And she managed to get it open. And it opened up onto her pool deck, but her legs failed as she rolled through the door frame, she got stuck, like, you know, momentarily. And as she rolled through the flames and debris and the door frame, she rolled out onto her pool deck and out her back door. She said embers from the house fell on her body, burning her skin and catching her hair on fire. Quote, I just kept rolling toward the pool and I could hear people in the yard toward the other side. And I knew my kids were going to be safe then. I knew they would get them out. She rolled and rolled until she fell into her pool. And then she, you know, screamed for help herself. Isn't that amazing? I can't imagine going through that. I just, I, I can't even imagine. Like, what do you think of that? Can you believe that? She survived. So some neighbors who live near Christy, Brad Ford and his wife, Tammy, were driving by just before 5 p.m. when they saw black and gray smoke pouring out of the sky, or into the sky, rather. Brad said they immediately stopped and ran to the friendly house, and they saw that there were already several people gathered in the driveway. One neighbor, Karen Walker, was already there. She was panicking and screaming 
screaming about the children inside, quote, We kept screaming there were babies in there. The girls and Ethan were like mine. Neighbor Shane Laurie said, quote, There were a couple of people in the driveway who were yelling there were kids in the house. I looked for a garden hose to spray water on the fire, but it was just a little garden hose. The fire was too big for that to do anything. Brad and the others then noticed a pink sock in one of the front windows. And this was as flames started engulfing the entire roof. So Brad, Shane, and another neighbor named David Hazelmeyer broke out the window and actually helped drag the body, it was Kayla, out onto the yard. David said, quote, It was me and three other guys, and we saw fire was coming through the eaves of the house. We reached the conclusion we needed to break the glass and do our best not to get cut. The men dragged Kayla out, who was found with her hands bound behind her back. She was also gagged with pantyhose, and there was a serrated knife blade sticking out of her back through her sweater. It was said her skin was so hot, it actually started sliding off as soon as they had grabbed her. She was gasping for breath and gurgling for blood, but even though there were two women who attempted CPR on Kayla, she actually passed away in the front yard. Officers and first responders were already on scene at this point, and the first officer on scene was Trigg County Deputy Sheriff Kenneth Butts, and he heard Christy's calls for help, so he ran around back and rescued Christy from her pool. He found her bound, badly burned, and the broken butter knife sticking out of her neck. She told Deputy Butts about her attacker, quote, She said she did not know him, but described him as a white male in a direct TV shirt. The knife in her neck was actually broken at the handle. It had to be removed surgically. And unfortunately, Courtney and Ethan would not be retrieved until the fire was put out. And unfortunately... Kayla, Courtney, and Ethan all died. They all succumbed to their wounds. Kayla had a couple of stab wounds to her torso, and she died from a very severe cut to her neck. It was cut ear to ear, and her trachea was actually visible, guys. 17 years old. Kevin had used a serrated steak knife on her. That was what was sticking out of her back. Courtney and Ethan also died from multiple stab wounds. Little five-year-old Ethan, right? Five years old, was stabbed nine times. Six in the back, once in the stomach, and twice in the chest. One of the chest wounds penetrated his heart. I just, I can't even imagine a five-year-old. Courtney was stabbed four times, once in the right side of the neck, and three times in her chest, and one of those stab wounds penetrated her left lung. Fourteen years old, dude. These were all babies. And I don't know if you'd call it a silver lining, but all three of the children died from their stab wounds. They did not die from the fire. I don't know how much of a silver lining that is. According to Kentucky State Police Detective Jerry Jones, who was actually the lead investigator on the case, quote, obviously they were killed during the course of this incident and left their bodies to burn and destroy any evidence in there. Now, Doug, Kayla's father, was of course very, very angry when he learned of his daughter's murder. Quote, to think that somebody went in there and did what they did to all all three of those kids. They're just an absolute monster, and I hope they find them. Roy, Courtney's father, said, quote, God, why do that to those three beautiful kids? I can't see why this happened. There doesn't seem to be any reason for a vendetta. It seems to be just a random act of violence. He expressed his regrets about not being in Courtney's life. Apparently, he had been largely absent, and he was, you know, totally regretting that he was never going to get a chance to reconcile that now. Quote, I haven't been in her life for a while. He expressed gratitude to other family and friends who had stepped up and, like, given her some sort of, like, you know, stable male figure in her life. Ethan's father, Jeffrey, never spoke to the media, so we don't have any quotes or anything from him. He remained, you know, private and quiet. Christy was rushed to the Jenny Stewart Medical Center, where she was treated, and doctors found trace DNA evidence that was left behind. And due to her injuries and trauma, Christy was at first unable to recollect, like, everything that happened. According to state police spokesman Dean Patterson, quote, due to the mom's condition, it took some time before we could speak with her. Um, yeah, I just I can't even imagine, guys. Can you even imagine? I just, that's one of the reasons this case really like freaked me out and why it was like tough to research. Like, can you imagine your home? That's where you're supposed to be most safe. Meanwhile, at the Dunlap household, Stephanie said that she and the children were stunned when they came home one evening and saw a trail of blood leading into the living room. Kevin was in there and he was nursing his hand. It had been cut really bad and it was so bad that Stephanie actually had to take him to the ER. When he was taken back, you know, the doctor was, you know, examining 
examining him and he asked Kevin how he had received the injury. And Kevin told him that he had cut it working on his truck. Now, this apparently immediately struck the doctor as odd because Kevin's cut was like a clean cut. Like, you know, from a blade. It was just not the type of wound that you would see working on an automobile. The doctor was so alarmed at this red flag that he left the room momentarily and returned with either, I don't know if it was a security guard or police officer or whatever, who again asked Kevin, you know, how he had received the injury. And Kevin repeated that he was working on his truck and had gotten cut. And as they were questioning him more and more, Stephanie saw Kevin get more and more agitated, start to get a little more irritated. And this surprised her because she had never once seen Kevin express this side publicly, you know? He only showed this side to, like, her and the children. So this really, you know, kind of made her step back. And I'm not sure what happened, but I think Kevin may have just been treated and was released. I think they just wanted to, I don't know, I guess make sure that Kevin hadn't been in a fight or was trying to hurt himself or something. Meanwhile, as authorities sifted through the ash of what was once the friendly home, lots of tips and information came in. Patterson, remember the police spokesman, said quote, we've got investigators that are doing interviews and following up every lead they come up with. State police had also initially told residents to be on the lookout for a direct TV van, possibly with a bloody man inside. And this is because some witnesses had stated they had seen a direct TV van in the vicinity not long before the fire. Quote, we were told a direct TV van had been seen in the area around the same time as the crime. And that Thursday afternoon when Kevin got home, he told Stephanie that he had been pin- pulled over by the cops and asked a bunch questions. Stephanie said that he seemed very nervous and excited. Kevin told her that a bunch of the guys at work had been pulled over. It looked like the police were, you know, pulling over literally anyone who worked for DirecTV. And he told her it wasn't a big deal. It just had something to do with that, quote, house fire in Roaring Springs. So, like I said, lots of tips and information came in about this case. One of the most important came from one of Kayla's friends, 18-year-old Matt Ledford. Now, Matt had actually stopped by the Friendsley household and had actually stepped inside when Kevin was it was still there. I don't know if he was in the middle of his attack or getting ready to leave or what, but unbeknownst to Matt, of course, he had almost come face to face with a killer, guys. So Matt told them that he had come to Kayla's home and he had knocked and called out and even entered the home, you know, stepping into the doorway. He said he didn't go venture beyond the front doorway. And I'm not sure if like the door was open and that's why he walked in. Maybe he was a super close like family friend or what. I'm not sure what caused him to actually step into the home, but that is what happened. And still no one answered. He said Christy's Jeep was in the garage, so he was surprised when he had pulled up in his own car and had to pull in behind another vehicle that was already parked in the driveway. A vehicle that he had never seen before. It was a 2004 to 2006 model extended cab Chevrolet Silverado pickup truck with a trailer hitch. And Matt was also able to give a partial plate number to authorities, H-E-Y. I don't know if these were just like letters in the license plate that he remembered or if they were like spelled hay in the license plate. But either way, this tip ended up being a huge break in the case. So according to police, with the description of the truck, along with the partial license plate number, they were able to track which county this license plate had been issued in. And then cross-referencing DMV records, they identified, who do you think, Kevin as, as having that type of vehicle. And once they ran Kevin's background and saw that he did subcontracting work for Direct TV, they put him under surveillance. And this started on Friday, October 17th, around 9, 9.30 at night. And they kept a 24-7 watch on him. So that same evening at the Dunlap household, Brooke had a sleepover with a friend, you know, just that typical, you know, I remember sleepovers, just, you know, staying up late, watching TV, eating popcorn, and the girls passed out in the living room. However, in the middle of the night, Brooke's friend had awakened, and she saw that Kevin was in the living room with them, and he was like, pacing up and down in front of the front window and was, you know, constantly checking out the front window as well. He looked very panicked and nervous and his whole demeanor just really freaked her out. She pretended to be asleep when she saw that he was looking over at her and Brooke to see if they were still asleep. And this friend later told Brooke just how freaked out she had been. So the next day on Saturday, October 18th, Brooke said she and Kevin Jr. were going to a neighbor's house to spend some time. Stephanie had to go out and do something with Aiden. So they were going to 
Lena go over to the neighbor's house while she was gone. Brooke said that she remembers her and her brother were not at their neighbor's house very long. They were playing out in the yard when all of a sudden their neighbor came out and ushered them inside. Told them to just, you know, sit down on the couch. Don't look out the windows. Don't go to the windows. Just sit down and be quiet. But of course, you know, they're, they're kids and Brooke's like, what? So she snuck a peek outside and she saw a bunch of cop cars surrounding their house. And as we know, it was the cops coming to arrest Kevin. They arrested him at his home in Hopkinsville about 1.30 p.m. And he was arrested by a Kentucky State Police Special Response Team and was charged with three counts of capital murder, four counts of capital kidnapping, one count of first degree sexual assault, one count of attempted murder, first degree burglary, and three counts of tampering with evidence. He was booked into the Christian County Detention Center located in Hopkinsville and was held without bond. And during his four hour police interrogation, Kevin denied everything. Denied that he had ever been in the Roaring Spring area except for a cable install job that he had had there a couple weeks ago. Jones, the lead detective, said, quote, he denied and denied he'd ever been there. And then finally said he did have a service call down there approximately two weeks before that. And Kevin continued denying having anything to do with the killings. Following his arrest, Kevin was placed in a cell by himself and was listed as being on suicide watch. Christian County Jailer Brad Boyd said, quote, with this type of crime, we'll have to keep a very close eye on him for his own protection. It's already very unpopular with the inmate population. Yeah, apparently they were really offended that Kevin had murdered children. Behind bars, Kevin was kept in protective isolation, as we just stated. He spent most of his day alone in a four by eight feet cell. He had a small bed, a small table, a hybrid sink and commode. He had no TV, but had access to reading materials and an AM FM radio. Boyd described him as a model prisoner, said Kevin's demeanor was very docile, was cooperative. He was soft-spoken, answered questions with, you know, ma'am or sir. And Boyd said it seemed like he was in shock. Quote, really, no emotion, just kind of blank. When Stephanie was questioned, she was absolutely shocked and flabbergasted and was completely shocked when the police told her that that story of the house fire was, was more than just a house fire. It was a murder. Stephanie said she herself was in utter disbelief and despite experiencing years and years of Kevin's own violent tendencies, she assumed that this violence extended only to her and the children, you know? And I wonder how common that is with, you know, partners and spouses and family that are abused is, yeah, do they somehow think that like, oh, probably because they've like internalized it to a degree, they think like, oh, it, it's me. I'm the one that gets them upset and angry. So like that anger is only towards me. That seemed to be kind of where Stephanie was at. So that's why she was like really shocked. Because I saw some people kind of acting like dicks about her saying like, oh, how could this dumb bitch say that she didn't know that he was capable of this and was so in shock? Like, dude, you don't like, you don't know though. Like she had spent spent years, decades being abused emotionally, physically, mentally. She had internalized a lot of that. So I absolutely think it's very believable and understandable that she would assume, oh no, this anger is only because me and the kids bring it out. I don't know. That's just sort of my two cents. When Stephanie went to visit her husband behind bars to, you know, try to get some sort of answers, explanation, she got nothing. Kevin told her nothing and said that she would get her answers when the trial came. Courtney's father, Roy, said of Kevin's arrest, quote, this is going to get some closure instead of letting this drag out. If this is the guy, I hope they just throw the book at him. Kayla's friends also expressed their thoughts when Kevin was arrested. Her friend, Casey Rexing, said, quote, it's very comforting, but at the same time, it's still indescribable and still hard to think about. Another friend, Danielle Reddick, said, quote, it's still the same. It still happened. She's not here anymore. She was my best friend and I miss her. Police searched Kevin's home where they found lots of physical evidence tying him to the crime. And this included two guns, a pack of zip ties, rope, four blue direct TV polo shirts, copies of direct TV work orders that were in the trash, 21 swabs of suspected blood throughout the house, a pair of white Reebok sneakers that had ash and blood on the soles, and they found a white handled pampered chef brand paring knife in the garbage. Patterson, the police spokesman, said, quote, we recovered some evidence that we believe links Mr. Dinlap 
to the crime. The evidence was located at his home. There was his pickup truck in the driveway along with the direct TV van. And as we know, of course, Kevin did not use the direct TV van in the commission of his crimes. Inside his pickup truck, they found dried blood on a door handle and on the inside of a seatbelt. Kevin's neighbor, Beverly Reiner, said Kevin had lived at the home since summer of 2007 and lived with his wife and three young children. She said, quote, he's just mild and quiet. The children are just adorable and they're such nice and well-behaved children. Beverly said that she didn't know Kevin all that well, just, you know, had talked to him when she was interested in having direct TV installed. No one really seemed to know a whole lot about Kevin. He just seemed kind of quiet and mild-mannered from the outside. Another neighbor, Lindsay Clark, said he and his wife witnessed Kevin's arrest and that he was wearing his direct TV uniform when he was arrested. So he and his wife, Lynn, were walking from their home to, I don't know, some sort of like pancake breakfast that was happening. And that's when, according to Lindsay, quote, we heard a loud boom. It sounded like like a cannon. Apparently this noise was like a diversionary tactic that the police had done. Wasn't sure what that was about. And the Clarks were, you know, walking when they heard all this. And that's when an officer came out of nowhere and stopped them and told them like, yo, you're going to have to stay here for like 15 minutes. He told them, quote, we're securing the area. You need to stay right there. And yeah, for 15 minutes, they had to just kind of stay right there, like on the sidewalk. And then they saw police escort Kevin out of his home in handcuffs. How wild would that be? Where like, you're just walking, it's just normal day, like, oh, I'm going to like this little little pancake breakfast thing, and then, boom, one of your neighbors is arrested. Now, as she was recovering in the hospital when this was going down, you know, it was only a couple days before they arrested Kevin. So she was in the hospital, and police showed her a photo lineup. And I think she was unable to do so the first time, because the photo they had shown her was just his Kevin's hairstyle was completely different than what it was when he had attacked her. So the police showed her another photo lineup, and I think she, like, still had to like cover up his hairstyle and by doing that she was able to identify him. And by October 20th Kevin was arraigned and he had public defender James Gibson assigned to him but he did not enter a plea at this time. On October 29th, Kayla, Courtney and Ethan were laid to rest in a combined funeral and though Christy could not speak because she was, you know, still recovering from, from her injuries she wrote out a statement that was disseminated to the whole funeral and she was released from the hospital that week so that she could attend her children's funeral, she was ushered around in a wheelchair, because again, she was still recovering. And her statement read in part, quote, What do I do with the anger and rage I feel toward the man who abused my children and me in ways too horrible to describe and left us to die? I know it will be a process for me, but I choose not to give in to hate. If I allow myself to be chained to hate, I will again become his prisoner, and I cannot and will not allow him to have any more control over my life. I want justice to the fullest extent of the law, and I know that one day, my God will judge him for what he has done to our family, and that will be a fearful thing. She said God kept her alive for a reason. Quote, I must find that reason. I know Kayla, Courtney, and Ethan want me to go on. I know God knows how I feel because he was separated from his son for 33 years and watched him die a cruel death too. Reverend Scott Dennis, who was Kayla's youth pastor when she lived with her grandparents in Florida for a time, read out a poem that Kayla had written when she was in the seventh grade, and it was called Great Wonders. She wrote about what she would see if she were the moon, including sailing ships, the shrilling sounds of a waterfall, dust from a cinnamon-filled star, and meteorites drenched in barbecue sauce. Her friends Danielle and Dakota Littlejohn recalled how Kayla loved playing guitar, loved quoting Bible verses, and just spoke about how excited she was to be back in Trigg County doing her senior year with all of her friends. Courtney's friend, Cameron Smith, spoke about how Courtney had ambitions to be an orthodontist, how she never wanted to let anyone down, and talked about how she shared her faith in Jesus. Quote, she was absolutely sunny inside and out. Ethan's preschool teacher, Susan Utter, offered small, clear glass stones that she called bubbles of joy to remember Ethan. She said he loved to draw with crowns, play with scissors, make things with glue, paper, and markers. He loved to wear cowboy boots and a hat. And in fact, a pair of John Deere boots were actually put on his John Deere tractor green casket. She talked about how he danced with a classmate to the Nutcracker, loved to take earthworms back home to his mother in a plastic bag. Quote, he doled out hugs. Now I'm not talking just namby-pamby little hugs. When you were hugged by this guy, you were hugged and he wouldn't let go until you hugged back. And roughly 650 people attended the Trigg County High School Gymnasium in order to remember Kayla, Courtney, and Ethan. 
Nathan. On Wednesday, November 12th, a grand jury officially indicted Kevin on all charges, plus they added a charge of arson on top of it all. He pleaded not guilty. Trigg County Commonwealth Attorney G.L. Ove announced that the very next day they plan to pursue the death penalty against Kevin. Quote, we have very competent, very strong, and very compelling evidence, and I plan to use every bit of it. I am keenly aware of the responsibility my office has in this case. I am also aware there is no justice for the three young people who died. Those three had no judge and jury, but it's my responsibility to see that Kevin Dunlap has a fair trial. On February 13th, 2009, Kevin's bond was set at $3 million cash. Ove didn't want any bond set, and this was based on that October preliminary hearing that they had, but Gibson, along with his assistant, Jason File, argued that they should get a chance to cross-examine any of these witnesses that spoke at this preliminary hearing, but Circuit Judge C.A. Woody Woodall III, that same judge from Christy and Jeffrey's divorce, who was ruling over this case, said that he would not set a bond based on that preliminary hearing. So Ove had then asked for a $10 million bond, while Gibson and File said that it should be lowered because Kevin did have a history of showing up to court when he was needed. So court records showed that Kevin had prior convictions and they were for two speeding offenses and a DUI offense. So Judge Woodall had set the $3 million cash bond. File said of that $3 million bond, quote, you might as well just not set any bond. There's no possible way he could come up with that kind of money. And he was right, as Kevin would continue waiting behind bars as his trial made its way through the system. In March, it was decided that Kevin's trial would take place in Smithland at the Livingston County Justice Center. And I believe this was something the defense had fought for and Ove actually agreed with them. That is one issue that could easily lead to a reversal of any conviction that may be had if there is one. So in a case of this magnitude, I always try to proceed very, very cautiously on issues that, in my judgment, always seem to raise red flags to appellate judges. So in moving a trial, judicial rules dictate that they look at adjacent counties from where the crime was committed of where they could hold it, and also make considerations of counties that were within the same judicial circuit. Livingston, Lyon, and Trigg counties all made up the 56th judicial circuit. So that's how they had come to the conclusion that it would be held in Smithland. In May of 2009, the defense argued that the four to five hour interrogation video that Kevin had with police after he was arrested should be inadmissible and not be able to be used at trial. And this was because they said that the statements Kevin had made to officers were made through coercion, intimidation. So as we know, on the day he was arrested, remember Kevin spoke with police and denied everything. Not only did that include the lead investigator, Detective Jones, he also spoke with Sergeant Sam Steger and Detective Steve Silfies. And according to Gibson, in trying to get this interrogation video thrown out, quote, it's very clear that Mr. Dunlap was asked questions without being Mirandized. Ove insisted that the only question asked of Kevin before he was read his rights was when he was served the search warrant at his home and he was arrested. Steger said that he had asked him, quote, do you know why we're here? And Steger said that Kevin's response to them was, quote, his wording was something to the nature of about the Roaring Spring deal or thing is what his statement to me was. Ove also showed the form that Kevin had signed and initialed in which he acknowledged and waived his right to an attorney, his right to remain silent. And Kevin actually initialed like specific points on this form in seven different places, each one indicating that he understood his rights, yet he still wished to talk. And in the end, Judge Woodall said that the only statement that could be stricken from the record was that initial statement that the police had asked him like, oh, why are we here? That was the only statement that they couldn't bring up at trial. Everything else was admissible. In October, Gibson filed motions with the court stating that they were going to go for an insanity defense, claiming Kevin had some sort of mental defect, though they did not specify at this time what that defect was. Ove responded to this motion by saying since he had started in 1988, he had never himself seen a jury find someone not guilty based on that defense. Quote, the ones where it has been used as a defense, there's been an outright conviction or a conviction of guilty but mentally ill. So of course, if someone is found not guilty by reason of insanity, they get sent to a hospital and treatment, right? But if someone is found guilty but mentally ill, that person still serves prison time. They're just allowed to get like mental treatment while they're serving time behind bars. And in November, Kevin was sent for a mental evaluation at the Kentucky Correctional Psychiatric Center located in LaGrange. And he stayed here for 30 days for an evaluation. In December, the defense tried to prevent Christy from being able to openly identify Kevin in court. And they argued that after the first photo lineup and she wasn't able to identify Kevin, the only reason she was able to identify him in the second photo lineup was because of pretrial 
trial publicity. Obey argued that the reason they had done two photo lineups was because Kevin's hairstyle was dramatically different in those photos than his current hairstyle. Gibson also wanted all evidence and witness testimony suppressed that came as a result of Matt's identification of Kevin's truck and partial license plate number. And they argued that the evidence collected as a result of this was improper because it was unfairly narrow, leading police to only consider Kevin as a suspect. They argued that the police should have looked at a wide range of body of trucks with similar styles. File said, quote, we're not talking about some sort of exotic vehicle. It's a Chevrolet pickup truck. It's probably the most common vehicle in the Commonwealth. But the prosecution shot back that the police had looked at other suspects, not just Kevin, but it was Kevin who hit all of the criteria they were looking for. From the time this became known as a homicide, they were checking into various people throughout the area. Now, the defense didn't specify what evidence exactly they wanted suppressed. Quote, police reports indicate most, if not all the evidence linking Dunlap to the crime is based on the initial identification of a license plate on a truck belonging to him. The defense also argued that the death penalty should be taken off the table completely. And this was because of a state Supreme Court ruling that had happened in November. And it required the state to set out its method of lethal injection in an administrative regulation. And Gibson argued that until the state complied with these regulations, which included a public hearing, this state Supreme Court ruling effectively put the death penalty on hold in the state. But in the end, Judge Woodall refused all of the defense's motions. There was a lot of physical evidence that the police had collected. And this was, of course, the evidence the defense was trying to target. So that blood found on Kevin's Reebok shoes matched Courtney's DNA, with scientists calculating that the chances of it belonging to anyone else other than Courtney was 1 in 12 quintillion. That's, uh... 18 zeros, folks. The blood found on the inside of the driver's side seatbelt was Christie's, with the chances of that belonging to anyone else being 1 in 130 quintillion. They also found Christie's DNA from some saliva on a Crown Royal whiskey bottle and blood on a paper sack that was in a trash in Kevin's home. That too was a chance of 1 in 130 quintillion that that DNA belonged to anyone other than Christie. Semen swabbed from Christie at the hospital matched Kevin and that was a 1 in 120 quintillion chance that it belonged to anyone other than Kevin. Additionally, swabs from Kevin's boxer shorts showed DNA from Christy, along with a t-shirt found in Kevin's home that had DNA from him and two other sources on it. However, the two sources were so genetically related that scientists couldn't, like, tell them apart. So, of course, right, when this is some pretty damning evidence. So, yeah, the defense was trying its best to get stuff thrown out. And I get it. Like, I was reading this stuff and I was like, like, really? You're going to try to get this thrown out? You know, that's kind of weak. But I get it, right? It's the defense. That's what their, their job is, right? Then in January of 2010, right before he was to go on trial, the defense filed motions to have Judge Woodall recuse himself from the trial. And this was because he had presided over Christie and Jeffrey Frinsley's divorce. Gibson said, quote, While it is understandable that the court may feel some connection to the victims in this case, it is impossible to know whether the court harbors any subconscious bias toward Mr. Dunlap. Certainly with his very life on the line, Kevin Dunlap is entitled to no less consideration than Woodall's recusal. Ove said that this was just a ploy by the defense in order to delay the trial. It had already been delayed once because the defense wanted to do more testing and the judge had, had granted it. And now Ove was saying that like, oh, they're just trying to pull this again. Quote, the position of the Commonwealth's attorney is this motion has no merit and was filed in the 11th hour before the trial. It's absolutely without question the prior divorce and custody dispute has no bearing on this case. In the end, Judge Woodall refused to recuse himself from the bench, saying that the divorce proceedings and custody hearings between Jeffrey and Christie had no bearing on his judgment or anything like that. Gibson tried to argue that no, it had to affect the judge's judgment because in the end, he had ruled in favor of Christie getting custody of Ethan only 15 days before he was murdered. And Woodall just said, quote, it is not unusual for litigants to appear before me in different roles. The defense also tried delaying the trial by requesting more neurological testing for Kevin. I just said they had delayed it once before. They were trying to delay it again. And this was after they were handed Kevin's report from the psychiatric facility on January 12th. And it recommended that Kevin, quote, should also have a brain MRI when possible to evaluate vascular abnormalities in the right frontal lobe. So the front lobes of the brain are what control judgment, impulse control, and inhibitions. Now, Gibson 
wanted Kevin to be given like a complete neurological exam, including an MRI and a PET scan, a positron emission tomography, and a PET scan. Uses a small amount of radioactive dye to record and create an image of an organ's use of blood, oxygen, and sugar levels. And this image is considered to be a graphic representation of an organ's activity. In hearing for this motion, if, you know, Kevin should get more in-depth neurological testing, was held. And a psychiatrist, Amy Trevet, talked about her interview with Kevin and how he refused to talk about his case while he was there. She said testing proved that he did understand the charges against him, the possible consequences of his actions, and he could assist in his own defense. She said while the radiologist had recommended the MRI and PET scans, the results of those, regardless of what they were, would not alter her judgment that she believed Kevin was mentally competent enough to stand trial. In the end, Judge Woodall denied the defense's motion to delay the trial for further neurological testing on Kevin. And just adding on to, again, doing anything they can to delay this trial, the defense then asked the court for an indefinite delay because there were seven pieces of evidence that they were having tested at an independent lab and those results were not back yet. And Judge Woodall just told the defense, quote, at the risk of sounding flippant, you just need to tell them to hurry up. And he refused the defense's request. And then, all right, in a surprise move, the day before he was to go on trial, Kevin instead pleaded guilty on February 9th, 2010. And when Judge Woodall asked Kevin why he was deciding to plead guilty now, he just mumbled, quote, it's what I feel is right. Woodall accepted his plea, which came with no plea deal, plea agreements, or guarantees from the prosecution on what his sentence would be. Apparently at first, Kevin tried to plead guilty by reason of insanity, but Woodall rejected this, saying, quote, I don't believe he is mentally ill, having heard his statements and find him guilty. So yeah, I think he instead just pled like outright guilty. Gibson and file both said that Kevin's plea was against their advice. And during a competency hearing afterward to see if the court could accept Kevin's plea, the defense called Dr. Michael A. Nicholas to the stand. He was a neuropsychologist and he testified about a brain lesion that they had discovered in his right frontal lobe of his brain. Dr. Nicholas testified that the lesion was a collection of blood vessels about a cubic of an inch in size. Quote, the lesion has not caused any mass effect, meaning it has not displaced any part of his brain. Parts of his cortex, the thinking part of the brain, and white matter, the communicating part of the brain, are just not there. He testified about this abnormality, how it can cause depression, headaches, and most importantly, impaired judgment and values, or even cause someone to lose self-control. Ovey asked Dr. Nicholas why why this brain lesion hadn't been detected before, because apparently Dr. Nicholas had given a psychological evaluation to Kevin in May of 2009. But Dr. Nicholas testified that his tests showed a personality that differed from others who had committed similar crimes and said that tests locating the lesion were not performed until the Kentucky Correctional Psychiatric Center ordered them to be done in January of 2010. He said pure psychological evaluations like the ones he had conducted in May of 2009 would not detect the lesion. But in the end, Judge Woodall found Kevin competent to know what he was pleading to and accepted his plea of guilty. Lots of people had thoughts when, you know, Kevin had, had pleaded guilty and it was all over. This was a huge story in the local area. Brad Ford, remember one of the neighbors who helped, you know, get Kayla out of the house, said of Kevin's guilty plea, quote, what else was he going to say? He knew they had all that evidence. He didn't want to face that jury and that lady, referring, of course, to Christy. A jury was still going to have to be selected, though, because they were still going to have to have a penalty hearing to figure out what Kevin's punishment was going to be. And remember, the death penalty was still not off the table, despite his guilty plea. His other sentences included 20 to 50 years behind bars and a range of life behind bar sentences. Could be with parole, no parole until at least after 25 years, or without the possibility of parole. And as jury selection was happening, the jailers who were responsible for looking after and transporting Kevin said that his demeanor changed after he had pled guilty. Trigg County Jailer James Hughes said, quote, he said after the first day, he felt there was a burden lifted off. I don't know what he meant by that. The Christian County Jailer Brad Boyd, remember, said, quote, he's different when we transport him and his behavior is different in court. He briefly talked about the proceedings and things that took place. He expressed his wishes to have closure 
but did not discuss the death penalty, as I recall. So a team of officers would transport Kevin to court between Hopkinsville and Smithland because it had been decided to keep Kevin locked up in Hopkinsville rather than the facility that was actually closer to Smithland. It was in Paducah. And this was in order to cut down on travel time for jailers and for general safety. The way between Paducah and Smithland had narrower roads and like a bridge and stuff, whereas the way between Hopkinsville and Smithland was just much more open. It was on like a four-lane highway and stuff. So they just felt safer just keeping Kevin locked up in Hopkinsville. After a jury was selected, opening statements for the penalty phase of Kevin's trial began on February 18th. Neighbors testified to the fire, how they had helped Kayla and Christy, the immediate aftermath, Police, firefighters, EMTs, doctors all testified. Kayla's friend, Matt Ledford, remember, who was actually starting to become a fire investigator at this time, also testified. Christy testified as well, recounting the horrific event. And she said, quote, I remember it like yesterday. Kevin never once looked up at Christy throughout her whole testimony. Sheila, Kevin's mother, testified for the defense, talking about Kevin's strict upbringing, his strained relationship with his father. She said she was stunned when she learned what her son had done, quote, I couldn't believe because I know his heart and I know how much he loves children. A bunch of neurological doctors testified about the brain lesion on Kevin's brain, though they seemed to be unable to definitively say whether this lesion had a direct impact on his behavior on October 15th, 2008. Radiologist Eric Shields of the Western Baptist Hospital testified that Kevin had a ping pong ball sized mass of blood vessels in the right frontal lobe of his brain and that this mass had actually probably been there since birth. Quote, a PET scan shows how a brain normally uses sugar. There's an absence of activity where those vessels are. It shows up as a cold spot on the image. He said that this could cause headaches, seizures, and possibly stroke-like symptoms. Neurologist Christopher King of the Murray Calloway Hospital testified that the right frontal lobe of the brain is the portion of the brain that allows a person to make responsible social decisions and estimated the odds of someone having this brain lesion and having these issues as one in 100,000 to one in one million. Quote, a person with this could have personality changes, memory problems, seizures, or hemorrhaging. It's hard to encompass all symptoms because the brain can compensate to a degree. And though King said that this was probably present at the time of the murders, he was unable to say if this lesion influenced Kevin's behavior or not. Dr. Nicholas testified again, agreeing that Kevin was competent to stand trial and competent enough to understand right from wrong, but quote, a square inch of his brain is missing. That seems like a small piece of tissue, but in context, a significant portion of the man's brain is missing. He explained the right frontal lobe of the brain is the portion of the brain that also considers consequences. It's responsible for inhibitions, we mentioned that earlier, and stated that Kevin's antisocial behavior might not have been displayed during his time in the army, simply due to the army's rigid discipline and structure. Quote, given the extent and size of the abnormality, I cannot say for certain if it did or did not cause Dunlap's behavior on October 15th. In certain situations, individuals can function essentially normally as they still have some right frontal lobe function. The psychiatrist, Dr. Amy Trevette, testified for the prosecution again, saying, quote, In basic terms, he appreciates the difference between right and wrong and can conform his behavior according to the law. While at KCPC, the Kentucky Correctional Psychiatric Center, he did not behave impulsively or make any appropriate communications. Nothing suggests this has any effect on his behavior. And in the end, after only three hours, of deliberations on February 24th, 2010, the jury sentenced Kevin Dunlap to six death sentences. Apparently, the only question the jury asked the judge during their deliberations was when was the first time Kevin had visited Christie's home. Kevin was then remanded to the Kentucky State Penitentiary in Eddyville, placed on death row. Doug, Kayla's father, said of the verdict, quote, The most important thing in my life is missing. There will never be repayment in any way. This does not replace the loss and pain her mother, me, stepmother, Jeff Friendsley, who was her stepfather, and even her extended family have faced. He said he didn't care if Kevin got life or death. Quote, I don't want him on the street, so they made the right decision. Christy said that closure was a fiction. Quote, there's no such thing. There's no closure for my family. And at this point in time, she had moved back to Ohio to be closer to family, and I believe she was remarried at this time as well. At his official sentencing on March 19th, Gibson and File filed a motion seeking a completely neutral 
trial for Kevin, arguing that Judge Woodall had prior connection to Christy because of the divorce proceedings with Jeff and did not recuse himself like they had originally wanted him to. They also challenged Kevin's ability to plead guilty, arguing that he was mentally incompetent, and nitpicked how the jury had been selected. All of their motions were denied, and Judge Woodall officially sentenced Kevin to six death sentences, three life sentences, and 55 years. For his impact statement, Doug said in part, quote, Next, I speak directly to you, Kevin Wayne Dunlap. You are nothing but a hollow shell of what was possibly once or should have been a man. However, you are not a man, but instead you are a coward and a monster. You are nothing but pure evil that attacked helpless and innocent children and their mother. I still find it hard to understand how you can sit motionless, emotionless, and void of reaction as the many photos and accounts of the aftermath of your crimes were described in great detail to this courtroom. It's clearly evident that you have no remorse for your crimes against my family in this society. Nothing brings me more pleasure than to witness you being sentenced for the crimes you have done. I only regret I cannot be allowed to determine your punishment on my own and carry it out as your personal executioner. And then on October 16th, 2012, Kevin's case was heard by the Kentucky Supreme Court. By this time, he was now represented by a new defense attorney, Kathleen Schmidt, who was arguing the same thing that Gibson and File had, that Kevin was mentally incompetent due to the brain lesion, which was discovered six days before his trial. Thus, he could not plead guilty, didn't understand what he was doing. Schmidt argued, quote, Dunlap's behavior was perplexing from the start. In short, he was willing to plead guilty even though he did not even know for certain what he was pleading to at the time the judge conducted the plea colloquy and he admitted guilt. What could be more impulsive? The brain damage affected Dunlap's ability to behave rationally at the time of his crime when he wore his work uniform from DirecTV and made no effort to hide his identity or role in the killings and when he pleaded guilty. Whether he specifically asked to be sentenced to death is irrelevant. The consequences of Dunlap's decision were exactly the same as if he had told the trial court he wanted a death sentence. Assistant Attorney General David B. Abner pointed out all the medical testimony from the neurological experts, even one of the defense's own witnesses, how they all testified that Kevin was competent enough to understand the difference between right and wrong, was competent to stand trial, and what he was indeed doing. Quote, Thus, if Dunlap was competent to stand trial, he was competent to plead guilty. To say that Dunlap's plea by its nature demonstrates incompetence is to denigrate Dunlap's freedom to choose. And on June 20th, 2013, the Kentucky Supreme Court upheld Kevin's conviction. And this was in a unanimous decision. After this, in December of that same year, 2013, Kevin sought to end all of his appeals and just be sentenced to death. He filed a handwritten motion with the Livingston Circuit Court asking a judge to stop his attorney's, quote, coercive efforts and allow him to waive all of his appeals. He didn't cite a reason for wanting to do this, just that his lawyers, quote, have in the past sought to continue pointless and unwarranted appeals in furtherance of their own political agendas. In April of 2014, Kevin reached a deal with his attorneys, now being led by public defender Roy Durham, allowing them to ask the U.S. Supreme Court to hear Kevin's case on the condition that they just keep him updated. In October of that same year, the Supreme Court declined to review Kevin's case. In November of 2018, it was reported that Christie moved from Ohio back to Kentucky, specifically Livingston, and it is said in the middle of her move back to Kentucky, she was diagnosed with stage 2 breast cancer, and reportedly she underwent a double mastectomy in January of 2019, and I think she's currently doing well living in Kentucky. Stephanie and her children, meanwhile, uh, went to therapy, definitely had a lot of stuff to work through. Stephanie said that she had a lot of guilt, especially because she didn't understand why Kevin would exhibit his violence to a completely unknown family. And she wondered if maybe like him targeting Christy and the children wasn't somehow him targeting Stephanie and the children. And she felt a lot of guilt over what she felt, you know, was what should have happened to them. You know, like I said, some people were kind of mean about her on the evil lives here. I think it's just because she just kind of came off a little stiff and a little awkward on camera. And some people do. And some people, I don't know, I just felt like they were really mean about it. Um, People are always mean to spouses who are abused. And I think it's because, you know, a lot of people, thankfully, have never been in that position. And she was young, dude. She was still in high school, okay, when she had Kevin. She already had a baby, too. So, come on, dude. It was so easy for an abuser like that to isolate and manipulate and control her, you know? And I do know after this, Stephanie did tell Brooke that Kevin wasn't her biological father. But Brooke seemed, at least in the interview I saw, she seemed to be, like, kind of like small con 
consolation. She's like, that was the guy who raised me. So unfortunately, he is my father, um, just not biologically. And then one more quick update. On July 15th, 2022, Kevin and his defense team requested a brand new trial. Kevin's new public defender is now Margaret O'Donnell. She's a death penalty attorney and is also a founder of the Frankfurt Immigration Assistance Network. She's an attorney for the Kentucky Poor People's Campaign and member of the board for the Wanda Joyce Robinson Foundation. She's joined by public defender Dennis Burke, who apparently has decades of experience as a Louisville slash Oldham County attorney and a legal partner for the greater Louisville area. So they were arguing for a new trial for Kevin based on four specific claims. That Kevin received ineffective assistance of counsel for failing to thoroughly investigate and present mitigating evidence, juror misconduct, and ineffective assistance of counsel in the jury voir dire that Kevin was denied the right to an unbiased capital sentencing jury and reliable sentencing, and that the trial counsel rendered ineffective assistance for failing to fully investigate and advise Kevin of a viable defense of voluntary intoxication coupled with the brain defect, which would negate an element required to prove intentional murder. So though O'Donnell and Burke filed these motions in April of 2022, apparently Kevin's earlier defense team had actually filed these same claims along with five others in September of 2015. So I don't know if those were rejected or what, but his new defense team was at least refiling those four claims. 56th Judicial Circuit Court Judge James Redd gave the prosecution until August of that same year to respond, which they did, and the prosecution was comprised of special prosecutor and assistant attorney general Chris Henry, who represents the state government in felony cases in Kentucky circuit courts, the Court of Appeals, and the state Supreme Court. And after they filed their response to the defense's motions in August of 2022, it is now up to Judge Red to go over the 400 plus pages of documents of the case and rule whether Kevin should get a new trial or not. And there has been no further update. It is expected that this decision is going to take a long time. There's a lot of information to go through. And as we know, yeah, these things can take a while. As of the recording of this video, it's February of 2023. So it's only been about six months and we'll see if Kevin will get a new trial or not. And that is the tragic just bizarre case of Kevin Dunlap. Like, what do you guys think about the whole brain lesion thing? I always say that that's why I always try to find out more about, like, killers and perpetrators is I want to know, like, how does this happen, right? Why? And... This one is just, I don't know, it's especially frustrating because, yeah, like, dude, he he butchered three children and traumatized and tried to butcher their mother, you know? And brain lesion or not, it just makes you angry, right? But that's the thing, right? Like, is it because of his brain? I don't know. What do you guys think? I just, I don't know what to think. Like, when I first read about this case, dude, like, I was incensed. Like, what Christy went through, what those poor children went through, oh, it just, it it hurts my heart. It pisses me off. And I always say I'm against the death penalty, but I, I will admit there are cases where, I'm not gonna lie, it is hard to have that stance. And this case is certainly one of them. But yeah, it's just, it's just awful. And, and senseless. And yeah, it's just, is it because of the brain lesion? He certainly had a history of violence, you know? I don't know. I mean, a, a brain lesion certainly seems to be the only thing that would, you know, give an answer as to why he targeted the Friendsleys, right? I don't know, man. A lot of questions. And this one just really, really bummed me out. Thank you again to Kristen Cook for pointing me to this case. It is, oh, it is certainly tragic and, and brutal. And man, yeah, I just, yeah, this one definitely definitely left me very depressed. This one was definitely hard to do research on. And I guess with that, I will wrap up this week of Crime Dive. Sorry if this video is a little shorter than usual. Like I said, I'm running very, very behind. It's why I need to take all of March off. Until we meet again, I hope you stay safe and happy and healthy out there. Remember, I say this all the time, don't be a dick. I I'm actually going to start saying this too. Leave a little sparkle wherever you go. Saw that on a license plate and I really like that. Like, leave, leave some sparkle wherever you go, you know? Just just be nice. Just be kind out there. You just never know what someone's going through, and you never know what just not being a dick does for people, you know? Alrighty, y'all. I guess I will let you go. Happy Valentine's Day. I hope whatever you choose to do, it's safe and happy. Hope you're digging my Valentine's Day look. Decided to do all the colors, red, pink, and purple, because I didn't know what else to do. If you don't have a Valentine, don't stress.
stress, I'll be your Valentine. I totally will. Alrighty, guys. I will see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.